I didn't get to watch a lot of the Olympics this year, but I saw enough to remind me how much work it takes to be an Olympic athlete. You basically have to decide what perfection looks like in your sport and then forsake everything to pursue it. Some athletes, like Hussein Bolt, do so with bravado that borders on self-worship. Others, like Gabby Douglas and David Boudia, glorify God when they win. But Christian or not, all of them shape their lives around an ideal and a goal. And I believe God would have all of us show that same devotion to an ideal and a goal. The question is, what ideal and goal are we supposed to be pursuing? I think the answer of Scripture is clear. We are called to be holy. Twenty years ago, when I first preached this passage, I introduced, perhaps for the first time to Trinity, two people who have become frequent contributors to our thinking and who affirm that the goal of the Christian life is sanctification or holiness. J.I. Packer wrote in his book, Rediscovering Holiness, if we play down or ignore the importance of holiness, we are utterly and absolutely wrong. Holiness is in fact commanded. God wills it, Christ requires it, and all the scriptures call for it. In reality, holiness is the goal of our redemption. As Christ died in order that we might be justified, so we are justified in order that we may be sanctified and made holy. Holiness is the object of our new creation. We are born again so that we may grow up into Christ-likeness. In the same way, Chuck Colson, who went to be with the Lord earlier this year, wrote in Loving God, Salvation, therefore, is not simply a matter of being separated from our past and freed from our bondage to sin. Separation means also that we are joined to a holy God. By pitching his tent in our midst, God identifies with his people through his very presence. But God demands something in return for his presence, that we identify with him, that we be holy because he is holy. Holiness is not optional. It's essential. These two contemporary writers echo the thoughts of Peter. Our text for today is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, and we'll see the call to holiness clearly in this text. But we also need to be thinking about the application, thinking about the question, how can you be holy as God is holy? So think about that as I read. 1 Peter, beginning at verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy." How can we obey the scripture's command, you shall be holy as I am holy? These verses give three central principles we can apply to our lives as we pursue this ideal and this goal. The first is set your hope on grace. 20 years ago when I preached this text, my first point was be prepared to be holy. But that isn't my first point now. Part of the reason is I've switched translations. The New International Version at that time translated this verse, therefore prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. That translation has three imperatives. Prepare your minds, be self-controlled, set your hope. The imperative prepare is the one that governed my first point. But it turns out that in the Greek, there's only one imperative. And this is captured well in the English Standard Version that I now use. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The imperative, the command, is set your hope fully on grace. Preparing your mind and being sober-minded are participles. 
ing words in English that describe action that goes along with the main verb. For example, we could craft a sentence that said, running full speed, Sonia run, sorry, bad English, let's try that again. Running full speed, Sonia won the race. The main clause is Sonia won. But running full speed was an important action that went along with and was essential to winning. So preparing yourself and being sober-minded are essential actions that go along with the main imperative of this sentence, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you. But before I explain these phrases further, notice that the sentence starts with a therefore. This is one of those important therefores found so frequently in the New Testament. This one reminds us that holiness follows salvation. The greatness of salvation was Peter's topic in the immediately preceding verses. And as Packer said, holiness is the goal of our redemption. As Christ died in order that we might be justified, so we are justified in order that we may be sanctified and made holy. Think about that. Christ died so that we would be justified, and we are justified so that we can become holy. It's ludicrous to think about becoming holy without salvation. It's like being that caterpillar who's trying to fly. It won't work. The caterpillar must first be made over into the butterfly. Then and only then can it fly. And we must first be justified by faith in Christ. We must be saved and cleansed from sin and made new by trusting in the Lord Jesus before we can even attempt to be holy. And if we have been saved, if we have been made into a butterfly, it would be tragic for us not to fly, not to begin to live this life of holiness. But we foolish people, we insist on trying to fly while we're still caterpillars, trying to be holy by our own works, or we insist on failing to fly when we've become butterflies, failing to grow in holiness after we've been saved. So having been saved, therefore you are commanded to set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 20 years ago, I'll admit, I minimized this part of the sentence. I didn't ignore it, but I also didn't say as emphatically as I do today that this is a grace system. Having been saved by grace through faith, we walk by grace we grow by grace, we are sanctified, we are made holy by grace. Grace alone, not by merit, not by works. Our hope is not in ourselves, but it's in God's sure promise of holiness. And the implication is that you and I will not reach complete holiness in this life. And we may not make as much progress as we would like, but we have a sure hope, a certainty of something not yet seen that when Jesus appears, we will be like him, which is holy, complete. For we shall see him as he is, and we will be transformed into his likeness. Our hope is fixed on grace. There's nothing else to stand on but grace. God is not glorified if we can take credit for our holiness. God is glorified if we know our holiness to be entirely his gracious gift. We were designed to be dependent. We were redeemed to become dependent creatures. And all the wonderful things God plans and promises for us are pointed to making us perfect, dependent creatures set entirely apart for his use. But the mystery of our faith is that God's gracious work on us, in us is never divorced from our cooperation. We cling to him to receive salvation by grace, and in this sentence, the participles show us cooperating with the grace by which he sanctifies us, being sober-minded and preparing our minds for action. In the King James, it says, girding up the loins of your minds. This is the image of someone getting ready to run. You see, it was hard to run in those long Middle Eastern robes. So the custom was to pick up the outer robes and tuck them into the belt 
thus preparing yourself for action. Peter says, do that to your mind. Make it ready for action. Just as no one ever won an Olympic medal without preparation, so no one ever becomes holy without mental participation and preparation. And we'll see next week that a huge, huge part of that preparation is immersion in the imperishable and abiding Word of God. Preparing your mind for holiness is the personal part of setting your hope fully on grace, just as running hard is the personal part of winning. And the second particle is like it, being sober-minded. The NIV says self-controlled. The implication here is that hoping in grace and growing in holiness requires a clear head. My personal experience is I'm far more vulnerable to sin when I'm not mentally alert, when my thinking is muddled. It seems like this pattern is seen whenever I fall into sin, whether it's irritation or impure thoughts or an uncaring attitude or whatever sin it is. When I look back on the specific temptation, I almost always find that I wasn't thinking while it was going on. I, I don't you have the same experience? When you sin, one of your frequent comments is, I know better than that. How could I have been so dumb? As I've always said for 20 years, sin, or more specifically temptation, makes you stupid. Satan works through muddled thinking and lack of thought. Sin thrives in that unconsciousness. God and holiness work in mental preparation and clear thinking, which revolves around telling yourself the truth from Scripture. But the preparation of your mind and even the focus on hope are directed at bringing the blessings of holiness into your life. Peter expresses this holiness first as a negative. Do not, then as a positive, do. So verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Do not conform to the passions or evil desires of unbelievers. This command is to be holy by not being sinful. Peter addresses us as children. The relationship we have with God is one in which he is our father and we are his dependent children, newborn babes, but also brothers and sisters to each other. But don't miss the key word that Peter slips in. We are to be not just dependent children, but also obedient children. In one sense, holiness comes down to this. In your relationship with God, are you an obedient child? I read a biography of Ann Wetherall Johnson some time back. She was the founder of Bible Study Fellowship. And her desire was to teach as an overseas missionary. And she did that in China until the communists kicked the missionaries out just a few years after she went. Returning to the U.S., she didn't know quite what to do with herself until five women at her church asked her to lead a Bible study. And she didn't want to do it. She asked herself, what have I come to? Am I to give more to those who already have so much? But as she prayed, she recalled the verse in Zechariah, for who has despised the day of small things? And she felt God had said, will you not do this one little thing for me? So out of simple obedience as God's child, she started to teach. And the result was Bible Study Fellowship, which is now an international organization that has turned many hearts, many lives toward Scripture. So we're children. We are to be obedient children by not conforming to the passions of our former ignorance. This word conforming is the only other occurrence of a word that's used in Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world. Or in the Phillips translation, do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. Interesting implications here. First, that these are desires or passions you used to have, but when you had them, you were ignorant, either of the desires themselves, or of the evilness of the desires, or of the consequences of the evil. You were ignorant. But second, in saying do not now conform to these passions, Peter implies that you still have them, or at least you still now have the habit 
of conforming to them so that you could still fall into these sins that used to characterize your life. But third, although you used to be ignorant of these passions and their consequences, Peter expects you to be ignorant no more. He calls us to recognize these evil desires and to deal with them so that we do not conform to the world. But what are these evil passions? The, the term is somewhat vague. Maybe it'll help if I share some of the lists of evil desires that we find in the New Testament. Take, for example, the words of Jesus, Matthew 15, 19. He says, for out of the heart, out of your heart, my heart, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Maybe you don't find yourself in those. Consider Paul's words in Galatians 5. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Here's a third list, Colossians 3. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put all of them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy talk from your mouth. So as you think about these lists, God may bring into focus some specific sin that you're struggling with. Ask God for his help in temptation. Repent of any instance in which you've succumbed. Seek God's forgiveness and strength to deal with this particular evil desire. Each of us has these passions, but to give in, to conform to them, is to forsake holiness. So, brothers, sisters, don't be ignorant of these things. Don't let temptation make you stupid. Being alert, sober-minded, self-controlled, cooperate with the grace of God that wants to make you holy. That, that's Peter's alternative to these negative behaviors. Do conform to the character of God, verses 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Our holiness is grounded in the holiness of God. We are called to be holy because he is holy. And this is the best, most compelling reason to strive after holiness, that God himself is holy and sin has no place with him. Peter quotes from Leviticus, where God repeatedly says through Moses, you should be holy because I am holy. Holiness is, in fact, one of the chief character qualities of the eternal God. Holy is used as the prefix to God's name more often than any other attribute. Isaiah often calls God the Holy One of Israel. And when the angels gather around the throne, it is this characteristic of God that they praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. This holiness is God's entire separation from sin, and it's his moral excellence and his purity. As one commentator said, God is totally good and entirely without evil. That's why Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sin cannot be in the presence of a holy God. Habakkuk says, your eyes are too pure to look upon evil. God's pure, undefiled character is completely separate from impurity and sin. To seek to bring impurity into the presence of holiness is to seek to have God be two things. A one can't be a zero if it's a one. Light can't be darkness if it's light. Matter and antimatter can't exist in the same place. A holy God cannot tolerate unholiness and remain 
a holy God. In another sense, holiness is a place. It's a region you can arrive at where God's pure and undefiled character is unchallenged by sin or impurity or evil. That's why the temple in the Old Testament was called holy. And within a temple was the holy of holies, the most holy place where God's presence was made known. And everything that came into the sanctuary had to be purified so that it too was set apart for the service of God. It had to be holy. And so for us, to be holy is to be separated to God. And only that which is pure and undefiled by sin can be separated and brought into that place where God's purity dwells unchallenged. This is the tremendous motivation for us to be holy in all our conduct so that we can be intimate with God. Leadership Magazine is a journal for pastors and Christian leaders. In 1982, Leadership published an article called The War Within. It generated more response from readers than any other article they ever published. The author, who did not give his name, tells about his 10-year struggle with lust and pornography. He talks about his behaviors, he talks about his guilt, he talks about his shame, he talks about his unanswered prayers and his vain attempts to control his desires. His healing began at a low point when he read a book by Francois Muriac, which claimed holiness is the one motivation that can conquer this powerful sin. He says, The author says, after disassembling the most common arguments I had heard against succumbing to a life filled with lust, Moriak concludes that there is only one reason to seek purity, the reason Jesus gave in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. (laughs) Purity, Moriak says, is the condition for a possession superior to all other possessions. God himself. If we sin, we forego the development of character and Christ-likeness that would bring us closer to the living God. The author says this, that thought hit me like a bell rung in a dark, silent hall. So far, none of the scary negative arguments against lust had succeeded. But here was a description of what I was missing by continuing to harbor lust. I was limiting my intimacy with God. The love he offers is so transcendent that it requires our hearts and minds to be purified and cleansed before we can possibly begin to grasp it. Fantastic stuff. God's holiness is the motivation for our holiness. We can only grow closer to him if we become holy. And Peter gives us one more practical clue as to how this can happen. He says, as he is holy, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. You see, he pushes the pursuit of holiness straight into your daily behavior. In all that we do, we imitate God's character. We don't get there only by ridding ourselves of sin and impurity, but we get there by consciously daily imitating the goodness, purity, excellence, and love of God. J.I. Packer says that holiness for the believer is living a life of service to God and becoming like the God we serve. It's like taking, it's taking God's moral law as our rule of life and God's incarnate son as our model for life. That may be why Peter earlier called us obedient children, because children do by nature imitate the character of their parents. As I've studied the lives of great Christians, I've found repeatedly that those who we call most holy define holiness as imitating the character of their father God. It's not just a list of don'ts, sins we must avoid. avoid. It's what we substitute for sin. So holiness is the words we speak, it's the acts of love we do, it's the way we pursue relationships with integrity, It's the witness that we take into the world of unbelievers. It's the service and sacrifice that we bring to the church and to the needy and to the oppressed. 
It's the quality of our daily Christian lives, striving with commitment to be like Jesus in all that we say, do, and dare. Let me tell you one more Chuck Colson story as we end. On Christmas Day, 1985, Colson was preaching at a women's prison in North Carolina. After the service, a prison official asked if he'd like to visit Bessie Ship, a prisoner in solitary confinement. You should know, the man says, that she has AIDS. At the time, very little was known about how AIDS was transmitted. You remember those days of fear. Colson says that he himself tried to think of any excuse to avoid going and seeing this prisoner. Then he remembers seeing Mother Teresa on TV at an AIDS hospice in New York City. And she had said, these people need to know that God loves them. So Chuck Colson went and visited Bessie Ship in her prison cell. It was Christmas, she was alone, and she was dying. He held her hand, cold as it was, and gently talked to her about Jesus and prayed with her as she received Christ as her eternal Savior. How can you be holy as God is holy? Like an Olympic athlete, we have an ideal and a goal the character of God, Christ-likeness, sanctification, sacrificial love. But we know we can't achieve this in ourselves. We have to set our hope fully on the grace that God promises, on holiness that will be fully realized in eternity. But even as we cling to that hope, we're called to prepare our minds, to order our thoughts so that temptation can't make us stupid. We're called to be nonconformist, to the passions of the world that would consume us. Instead, we are to strive to bring Christ-likeness into every circumstance of life. This hope and these principles turn an impossible challenge into a gracious call from your Father. Be holy in all that you do. Let's pray. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, make us like you. Work in us, Lord. Having saved us, sanctify us. Allow us to grow in Christ's likeness. Allow us to be aware of sin and the evil of the world around us so that we're not stupidly defiled. Allow us, Lord, to be aware of the conduct that imitates your son so that we walk more and more after him and are more and more holy in his likeness, in his image. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.